agent. And now I'm going to go back to that other one on Irish that sold at 675. All right, three bedroom, two bath, a little bit smaller, little bit smaller house, but do you think a hundred square feet makes a huge difference to a buyer's perspective of value? If they walk in and they go, oh, this feels like it's 1580 square feet, not 1650. <laughs> Never had a client do that. <laughs> Connecting the cloud, it records and goes live to the suite. Okay, there is gonna be a little delay, so I don't know if you're watching us on Facebook, Melissa. Okay, no. Okay, cool. Um, today is Monday morning, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, 9 a.m., we're gonna be doing cloud. So matrix, tips and tactics, and then different strategies. I'd like to hear from what you guys use um, to make CMAs, kind of combined it together. To be honest, I kind of mix a lot of different systems into one thing just based on how I feel the client is gonna talk to me. So Sandra and I went on a listing presentation last week. I had a packet, probably 45, 50 pages thick. I think I opened it up once during the whole entire presentation. I went off of like, I think it was a one page CMA to talk about properties. And then when she started having questions, I kind of scrolled through the CMA, went to the pictures just to show her one or two properties. So I think I was overly prepared for the CMA. It was more just chatting with her. And she just really wanted an opinion of what my opinion was, but I didn't really have to validate anything. It was just all kind of like, it made sense. So most of that making sense was because of the preparation that I did before going to the listing presentation. I was so fresh with my numbers and my stats and everything. It did flow and I didn't have to revert back to my actual report. So. With that said, I'm going to jump right in. We're going to go over matrix this week. And if anybody wants to know flex, I'll be doing a Santa Maria class, same thing, but just using flex, which I got to say, I'll probably talk to Albert about. I'm not as, as fluent in flex as I am in matrix. Matrix is like second nature. When you start to do your CMA, do you do it the day you're going to go do your presentation, the day before? Or okay. Week before? So let's start there. Um, obviously, everybody knows I will walk if May doesn't know how to log into MLS yet. I'll walk you through, but you want to get to your dashboard. Question is, when do I do my CMA? Um, I typically will investigate the property before <laughs> the meeting, like a day, two days before to identify whether or not it's gonna pull a lot of my time or if this is gonna be literally a 30 minute job. So on a lot of cookie cutter properties, if you're going to a subdivision, if you're going to a standard three bedroom, two bath home in a standard area, you're probably gonna have enough data to be able to whip this out pretty quickly. Um, if, if you're doing a rural, a ranch, it's got wells, it's got, I mean, it's just, Nancy has one. There's three units on the property under one APN. It's got a ranch. A couple of them are income producing properties. That's a unique property. It's probably going to take uh, at least an hour to two hours to like really digest what's going on here. Um, there are different ways other than comps to pull value on a property. So I'm going to show you the most basic way and then I'll show you kind of the tips that I use if I have to get advanced because when I go to the table, I don't just take one opinion in one direction. You know, if my whole scenario is wrapped up around a comp, I want to have two, three supporting different directions. So if she's not in agreement with my comp, I can instantly change the topic and talk about days on market, talk about price per square foot, talk about uh, what the sellers, what, what she was able to appreciate over the years that she's owned it and not to get too greedy um, if the numbers, if she's pushing, we had a client that she pushed way outside the limit and I had to pull back and even tell her, even at the number we're pulling back on, it's still exceeding what I think our value is, but I'm okay with that. As long as you're not going to put pressure on me that we didn't sell it in the first week, I need time to analyze the data and then come back to you. And if it still is not getting showings and we need to make adjustments. And she agreed to that and we put that down and at least we're both on the same page. I don't want to take a listing more than 65 days or else it's a waste of her time and my time and I'm, I'm actually devaluing her property. So um, does anybody, hey Missy, 
Does anybody have a property? Hey, Kyle, good morning. Does anybody have a property or an address that we want to analyze? Yeah. Do you? Sure. Yeah, okay. Let me, yeah. well, what, let me hear both of them and then we'll figure out which ones I, I want to um, do. <laughs> it's that new one that I just went into escrow with in okay. Luciano that I feel is way overpriced, but I just pulled some soft comps. Okay. And I'm in contract for full price just to get it because we're multiple offers. Okay. And mine's a potential upcoming listing for. Okay, I don't want to touch that. Yeah, 439 cents. In good point. I don't want to touch that. Never mind that. Okay. So <laughs> um, for yours, I don't think I want to touch that either, okay. just because there's already a list price on it. I don't want that to influence what you guys think the value is as we start looking at it. Do we have something that's just totally off, not on market? You can do my house. I'd like to know because we're going to list it in April or March of next year. So, okay. but mine, you know, it has a well, it's septic, solar. Yes. It's a little bit more complicated. So. Okay. And I think, um, I, I don't want to. There are comps and there's houses that sold up the street within the last year. <laughs> do mine. Do mine this. And we have repairs that you're going to be going through. Not. So I don't want to yeah. talk about that. Okay. Um, I mean, do mine that's on the market. We're getting showings, but it's. Okay, let's do that one because um, I would be brutally honest and be I'm, like, I here's what we want. Totally <laughs> no, it's my personal process for price reduction, anyways. So this would be great. Okay, um, cool. Now, before you talk about what your price was when you went to the seller, I don't want to know that. Nope. I don't want to know your listing presentation. You really we're, we're um, and I want to see how we. Okay lined up with that but could you write down what your price was that you were trying to get when you went to the seller and write it down on a piece of paper well, turned it's upside down. you got your price or did you get the seller's price i don't know yeah no you're right okay, okay. I'll write that. all right there's a difference between your recommendation and the seller's price um always you're going to come to the table and the seller is either one they're going to be like okay cool uh typically they're like dang you're probably spot on, but I still don't care. I want to list it higher. And you need to have some objection handling to at least get it within 3% of what you think your opinion is. That's always my recommendation is 3%. So if you said the house was 700,000, um, then 3% is going to be 1421. The highest that I would take would be a 720 listing. If she's like, I want 750, mm -hmm. then I will sit at the table and I will tell her how uncomfortable I am about it. Not necessarily going to say no. Um, that is exactly what happened at the, you know, our client was like 430. And I was like, I was thinking more like 409. And that was even at the top of my 3%. You know, like 415. And that was the top of my 3%. We ended up settling at 419 with an understanding on based on the, the, the showings and the activity, we might end up doing a price reduction down to 409 for the next after 30, 45 days. So she started way up here and I said, there's nothing statistically uh, allowing this to happen. It would be an emotional buy. It would be, we're setting the market limits right now. So the market's already be getting pushed and all of a sudden we can kind of see our numbers in general and our local market starting to shift and the pendings are coming and the actives are coming down and the amount of solds are coming down. Well, if that's the case, are, did we push the market so hard that now the market's kind of pushing back? And can we continue to keep pushing the market for this appreciation that everybody's been getting for the last two, three years? So that's, that's the question. And if, as days on market go longer, you have to explain that to the seller that you got your appreciation, you know, you got it. Now we're trying to sell it so you can collect it. And if you keep pushing it, you're going to push outside your window. Um, Cause it has shifted. All right. So what is the address that we are going to look up today? 289 Irish way. 289 Irish way. Okay. So the first thing I would do is I want to double check if this property's ever been on the market before. Um, I'm going to do 186 Irish way, one that's not listed and I'll use yours as a comp. Let's just see if, if that even is a, or do 280. I know it's the same floor plan. It is. Yeah. And I don't think it's been on the market. <clears throat> all right so say the homeowner comes to me i want to know what my prop property is worth first thing i'm going to do is try to see if it's ever been on the market you can see that it's been on the market great that's all i care about not necessarily anything about the house um i would take an old cma an old comp of the property 
Again, if it hasn't been on the house, if it hasn't been on the market, I would go to realist and I would pull up the tax records and I would print the tax records. I just need to know square footage, bedroom size, baths, um, just the basic information, lot size, that information's on realist. It's on my first AM, you can call title companies if you can't get it here. If you get it here, you're just gonna click on the, the listing. Cool, here's our property. Here's our property. It's a three bedroom, two bath, 1668 square feet. Again, I don't know what the condition of the inside is. I don't know anything other than the basic information. It's a 6,000 square foot lot, three bedroom, two bath, 1600. This is a cookie cutter house. No problem. Um, what I would do then is take the listing number and I'm going to copy this. So you asked, well, what happens if I don't have an address or I want to do a radius or whatever? I always start with a radius search first on my CMAs. I just want to know what's going on around me. And instead of typing in the address, you always get defaults where it's like you forgot to put way or avenue and the system's like, oh, I can't find the property. Just take the listing ID number. It can be 10 years old. It makes no difference. Then go to search residential. And I'm going to plug that listing number in right here. Boom, so now all I'm telling the system is do a radius around that listing. I don't even care if it's the, the actual house. It just needs to be a home in the neighborhood. So if you can't find the house that you're trying to do a search for, find the neighbors. There has to be somebody within, <coughs> you know, down the street or whatever that's sold. Because all we're trying to do is get an, a, an idea of what's going on around it. No. So this is what I'm looking for down here. I want active, pending, closed, active under contract and expired and withdrawn. Why? Because if I come up short on my listing, on my comps, I'm gonna use that as, hey, this person tried to sell and they couldn't even sell. So what makes you any better than this person? So depending on what type of comps you end up getting, but I wanna see the whole picture. I got 109 properties, way too much. So if I had five properties, I'd increase my radius. If I had 109, I'm gonna bring it down to 25. 0.25 and how do I refresh? Well, you have to click in another field that I'm here. So yeah, on another. There you go. All right, so I got eight now. Eight to me is still too small. I mean, again, I'm just trying to get, cap, get data. I'm not trying to actually pick my comps. So too small, I want to get around 20, 20 properties. Then I can manually go through them. Um, I do not use third-party software to plug in. I have a three bedroom, two bath, 1700, give me my comps. So Cloud CMA allows you to say, pick my comps for me. No way, this, this is like raw data. You need to analyze it yourself. So, boom, uh, 26 properties, perfect. So now I'm gonna hit results. Uh, over here, three plus bedrooms. I don't want to put a two bedroom against a three bedroom. Yeah, drop, 23. drop 23. And when I went and looked at the neighborhood, I got to have at least a ballpark figure. I don't want to pull condos up that are 200,000. If I'm in a, if I'm in a nice neighborhood, you got to have kind of an idea that, okay, those houses are <laughs> between 600 and 800,000, you know, just a ballpark. That's a pretty big range. Um, where do I pull that information up? If you absolutely have no idea, you can use like a Zillow or all these things are analytics to just give you a starting point and then knock 50, 70,000 off this way and knock 50, 70,000 off that way. But if you don't have a ballpark idea, then comps probably aren't going to be the direction to compare, make this a, a comparable. You know, if, if, if it's not a cookie cutter type home and there's been sales in the neighborhood, then you're going to have a hard time finding comps in the first place. So now we're going to have to use a different strategy to come up with evaluation, maybe days on market or price per square foot or something along those lines. Like really look at the average price per square foot and start analyzing it that way to come up with your range. So if average homes are selling for 380,000 price per square foot and you have a 1500 square foot house, that at least gives you a starting point. What is the math on that? Let's see if that even lined up. Well, when you put 600 in, it's dropping. So that came 608. 
So 608 to 800,000, at least I have my range. Boom, so I'm back down to 12. So now I'll jump up to one mile. Huh. The property's hard because like you go up literally less than a quarter of a mile up the street, all those houses have deep ocean views. We'll get, that, right? we'll get into that, we'll get into that. So all we know right now is a three bedroom, two bath, 1668 square feet with a 6,000 square foot lot, right? That's what we know. So now I'm gonna hit results, boom, everything comes up. First thing I'm gonna do is put them in price, price square, price, yeah, low to high. Um, then I'm looking for anything that, up oh, here's one on Irish right here, that sold. Irish is, our, we're looking on Irish Street. So here's an Irish. Um, and you do have to kind of know the streets a little bit. Tell me if anybody, Irma Way, there's another, no, that's no, Toucan that's, Terrace. That's, yeah, yeah. Sea Views, this house that she's talking about is in Sea View, which is our HOA. It's yep. literally a circle, yep. and it's only one street. Here's another Irish Way that's active. Oh, there's our property right there. And, okay. So because the property has been on the MLS, well, which one were we looking at? We were looking at 280. Okay. So this is not our property, but I'm going to click on it. And I'm going to look three bedroom, two bath, 1858 square feet. So we're 200 and something square feet bigger on a double the size lot. That's a significant difference from 280 versus 289. Larger lot, bigger house. Just write notes about that. Larger lot, bigger house. This one's been on for 32 days. It's been active and it obviously has not sold at 739. At 390 price per square foot. Let's see if anything else is looking at the pictures real quick. Because this is a cookie cutter house and I'm doing 280, this is a great comp. I just have to go through and go, okay, uh, let's see what the condition on the inside is. Looks like a standard 1990s at 94, carpet, Let's see if that tile, countertops is tile. This is a straight now out of the 1990s home, no upgrades. So it's not like I'm nitpicking everything. I'm just in my head, uh, no upgrades, built in the 90s, large lot, larger than mine. So if my house on 280 has been remodeled, that's gonna offset these that have not been remodeled. Yeah, but I don't need to go through and be like, well, I got granite for thirteen hundred or thirteen thousand dollars, and I got countertops, and I got cabinets, and this. No, you got a remodeled property versus an unremodeled property. Just, you just put a blanket there. Um, all right. So I'm going to click this one because this is a good comp. Then I'm going to go back to my one line agent, and now I'm going to go back to that other one on Irish that sold at six seventy five. All right, three bedroom, two bath, a little bit smaller, little bit smaller house, but do you think a hundred square feet makes a huge difference to a buyer's perspective of value? If they walk in and they go, oh, this feels like it's 1580 square feet, not 1650. <laughs> Never had a client do that. Maybe because this is a single or two <coughs> is, is, is garage living space? No. no. Now with the perspective, matter yes. Up? Now with the perspective to a buyer, a two car versus a three car bring value to a property. Absolutely. What type of value? 10 grand, five grand, you know, not, not an overwhelming of not the cost to actually build it, but just an idea. If everything is all the same and then you have a two car versus three car, it's also not a matter of price. It's a matter of seller's motivation. You have a better product than that person down the street. So, if this person down the street has been on the market for 20 days and your seller's motivation is, I want to sell, well, we need to beat the next product on the market because your product is better. If I had a buyer that walked into the house down the street, walked into yours, and you have a three car garage, they're going to want yours regardless of the, if the price is, is, is there. But if the price beats them and you have a better product, you have a better chance of getting that buyer and it only takes to one. So all we have to do is beat them by 500 bucks. We have to beat them by a thousand dollars. Beat them by even if you priced it the exact same, we have a better product. So would you rather price it up and then try to come and settle at the same price, 
or show that we're the same exact on the market and we're gonna collect that buyer first. And we're piggybacking off of their marketing. They've already tested the market. Really, is it really a big difference if you got two, $3,000 more in this type of market? They've already tested it and no one's coming, it hasn't sold yet. It's like, you know we're gonna negotiate when we get an offer anyway. That's what buyers do. Um, so this one, this one did close. It closed in 17 days. If the average home is, is sitting on the market and it takes 60 days, this is, I do look at this on my old comps and I go, okay, someone sold in one, two days. They left money on the table. It's like, congratulations to that agent. That's great. But if it's sold one in two days and the average days on market are 60 days, then they didn't push that hard to make it happen. And if I'm talking to my client about it, it's like, are you wanting to push or are you wanting to sell immediately? You know, that is just a description of what happened on the market. That's not what is my motivation, my seller. My seller is like, yeah, I want to get the most money for my property. Okay, well, this we know for a fact everybody's going to see. So this is the range. If you want to push a little more, I'm okay with coming up to 685, 680, maybe even 700. I'm okay with that. I'm still within my 3%. You know, if this thing is very identical to it, 3% is my range. If I'm within 3%, I don't care where they put the price. Let me turn that off. Uh, because 3% gets negotiated all day long. And I usually land within 1% of the price that I gave them an expectation. So I don't go to the list table to tell them what to list on. I go to the list table to tell them what I think offers are going to come in at. There's a different strategy there. It's, this is what I expect you're gonna net and, and this is what offers are gonna be. Buyers are gonna wanna negotiate with you. You wanna stay and get the, high, the highest money possible. So if we did that, we need to come here. But if you push me more than 3%, we're gonna be sitting on the market for a very long time. It's, so it really didn't even have to come down to the price. I gave them a ballpark figure. They knew what they wanted to sell their house for. And she said, I wanted to sell it for this. And I went, you're outside my 3%. That's my comfort zone. Like, I, do you want to list your house or not? Do you want to sell your house or do we just want to get activity? So um, three bedroom, two bath. Do you, does anybody feel like this is a good comp based on the data that we have? Three bedroom, two bath, 1600 versus this. Yeah. yeah. Click it. Click it. I'm trying to get three actives and three solds. That's it. However, I am taking this page right here. I print this page. Mm -hmm. I put it in order from price and I take this with me. Because what do you think this shows me when I look here? What, am I, what do you think I'm looking for? I've done my work. I'm looking for trends in the market. Trends right here in the market could literally give me a 15 minute conversation without even opening my CMA. I'm looking for, I got prices at 620, 625, 629, 630, 649, 650, 659, 675, 675. This is a market that is cookie cutter. If you see a trend that's like 620, gap, gap, 670, you have a, you have a conversation piece. If you see a block in the market that's like this type of home is selling in the low sixes and then we have a, a market here that's in the mid sixes, you have a gap. If you're in here in this, this high part gap and your client's trying to price over here, they're creating a market that, that doesn't allow, say like a, a town home. You have a, maybe these are three bedroom, two bath, 5,000 square foot lots. And then you have three bedroom, two bath with an office and views over here and you can see the trend that hey you're here but you're trying to get these prices and now it's if we price at 620 is the average and you're trying to price at 650 you're trying to create a market based on these comps i'm not telling you it's not possible but let me explain what the competition is and what what we're trying to accomplish here at a 650 price that's beyond my 3%. That's 18,000. The most I would go is 638. You're trying to go 650 on it, creating a market. You're aggressively pushing the market to try to get your property value up to 
where these have views and yada, yada, yada. So it's, would you agree to settle at a 635 price? Would you agree that in 30 days or 15 days when I get my data back, if we're getting a ton of views and we miss the curve, you understand that your days on market are going to be a lot longer. What is your motivation? I'm trying to sell immediately in the next 30. I'm trying to sell by the end of the year, six months, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's then I go, I immediately know that I need to go in my listing presentation and talk about the importance of the bell curve of the first 30 to 60 days on the market. That's it's, it just, it guides me over here now. So it's, it's all right. Well, this person wants to push the market. I need to make sure they understand the, 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 the possibilities of harm it could do by being on the market more than the average on the market time. So if, if they give you that, you got to take them over here. That's your objection. They're pushing the market. You can see it in a trend in your head. You're going, I see this clear as day. I got to make him understand it. Show him the part on the CMA that talks about the bell curve of 30 to 45 days, a hot part of the market. Then you're taking them down to, well, the, 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 um, um, your coming soon property premiere, your excitement of the first 30 days, you're talking about that objection handling. But, okay, so we got two comps. Wow, this definitely takes me on a tangent. Um, before I keep going on, anybody have questions in any of this? Okay, Irish way. Now let's start going through. So we got two listings that we picked. I got 38 I need to go through. So I got Irma. This is a three bedroom, two bath. 1359, not horrible. It's over in Toucan Terrace. So I know that that's the next neighborhood over. This is still a conversation piece. I'm going to pick it. Doesn't even matter. Okay. It's 589. It closed at 620. Great, horrible comp, but great conversation piece. You know, they're like, Hey, buyers here are going to look in this neighborhood. They might have the same view as you across the street. Totally different neighborhood, different feel of everything, but the view, if somebody's view is important to them, or if it was a buyer in general, they're gonna look at that property just like they looked at your property. It's not like they're, good Lord. Just turn the volume off for people. Okay. Technical difficulties, everyone. It's because of the battery. Um, all right. Okay, um, there we go, it'll go. Um, 10 days on market, that's cool on that other one. On the other one? On the one you just clicked on. So good. I'm not saying that the agent does a bad job or anything like that, it's just I wanna to recognize to the client that someone that grabbed their first offer and it was perfect for that seller came right in that range, but they didn't test the market. So they just took the market for what it was. They didn't try to push the market up, um, uh, you know, but it, it motivated the seller. It was exactly what that seller wanted. But if my client is like, I want to be here, that is a hard negotiation to get them back down to here. So there has to be some sort of settlement, which means you have to give a little bit on your opinion, on your price to kind of go, all right, am I within my 3% range? In my, you know, that I, I lean on my 3% so much. If I come to the table and I'm like 390 and it's, they're pushing me to 430, I know we're gonna end up settling. I'm, I'm gonna push them to the 410 and I'm gonna use that as an excuse to say, hey, come down with me. They didn't have a chance to really test the market. They took the first offer or maybe they had multiple offers yeah. and they took the best, That's but they took it. They didn't test the market. So that means we really can't use this data a hundred percent to really lean did the market allow more it didn't give us enough time so that that's just an excuse to say it's hard to really analyze this property because it wasn't on the market long enough but buyers are going to see it regardless they're not going to think about days on market they're just going to see the sold price it is going to affect you you know even if it was four days on the market it still affects you it is a sold comp it, you know we have to take that into consideration um all right, here we go. Uh, four bedroom, two bath, 1600. That's in Grover. That's in Grover. No good. Grover and Pismo, huge difference. Let's see if there's better comps. Another Grover, garbage. Ah, uh, garbage. Why am I saying it's garbage? Big reason. Grover Beach, 
huge difference, even though it is just right across the street. That right there is huge. So if I run out of comps, then I have to come back to it and bring Grover in, but I'm gonna go through my list first and see if anything's better. On your criteria, are you single family homes? Um, no, I just did a radius okay. because there's 38 properties. At the end of the day, I'm gonna look at it and make that decision just by looking at it and going, not even a comp. Yeah. So moving on, I got 38 to make it through Brighton and Grover. I can do better. Uh, Newport, Grover, Pismo Beach, okay. Three bedroom, two bath, 1,400 square feet. It's up, is that a toucan as well? A little further. Still gonna use it, it's within, it definitely is the radius of like, if a buyer walked into the neighborhood and there's this neighborhood over here, some buyer's gonna go look across the street. That one's just above it and it has more of a view. And I think the property you're talking about, Missy, has a view this one, a little bit. From the yard. From the yard, yeah. Back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Expired, Grover, so now I'm getting in, Pismo and Village, uh, three, two, two can, might as well put it in. <clears throat> so, yeah. I have a question, but I don't know if it's premature. Um, in my thinking, single level was a, a big selling point okay. for the demographic that would be looking in that neighborhood or be, who wants Pismo single level. Okay. Oh, so, so I don't even know some of these comps when I, so, think, I was like, no, no. But again, we're not using it as comps to go, this is it. We're using it as conversation pieces okay. to make sure she's aware of what the market's doing. Because where you're trying to find single level, a buyer may go single level, two levels. I really don't care. I want to know what's going on. You know, I'm going to go look at everything. So you, know, you just, yeah. So I put it in just, there just as a conversation yeah, piece. Yeah. We've already gotten two comps that are pretty good yeah. to be able to come to our range. And again, I'm not coming to them on, this is what I think we need to list for. I don't put that down on my CMA. Mm -hmm. I say, this is what I think offers are gonna come in at. I come to the table with the mindset of what is the buyer's perception of the market? Not what is your house worth? It's what do I think buyers are gonna beat you up on? What are buyers competition? Where are buyers gonna be looking? And how do we get in front of our competition? And then is that in line with what you think the value of your house is? I do tell the client, don't even tell me, just like I told you, don't tell me your price. I'm going to write my price down. I want you to write your price down. Because at the end of the day, they have to explain why they came up with that value to me, just as I'm explaining to them. Who's going to be more prepared? Yeah. It's like, I'm going to have tons of data about market. They're going to have, I have a beautiful countertops and I have a, a three car garage and this, and they're going to put- I need this amount or I need this amount to do, to make this work. Those are not controllable things that a buyer's perspective, perspective cares about, you know? So if, if I was a buyer and I was walking down the street and I looked at your house and then there's a house next door in a neighborhood that has nothing to do with it, I'm still going to go look at it. And if I look at it, if there's a huge difference in value, that can sway someone's mind of whether they're going to buy because they can live with the, the crappy carpet if they're saving $50,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I didn't even need to talk about anything else but that. Yeah. And, and I'm done. Like, let me hear from you on why you think your value is. Okay, well, here's two in the neighborhood that have sold. I could literally close a deal with just those two comps because just talking about them about the perspective the perspective of a buyer's mindset mm -hmm. stick with that because that it's hard to like go it's hard to argue that okay so what do you do when you're on a listing appointment and sally homeowner says well molly down the street it's showing that she sold her house for eight hundred thousand, but i know molly gave them ten thousand dollars at closing for new carpet perspective of a buyer what does a buyer see is a buyer going to be able to call that other client no, and ask the them about that $10,000? No, but my job is to make sure that everybody's aware of that. So I will take that into consideration. That's a valid point. But on a buyer's perspective, when they're online looking at Zillow laying in bed, yeah. are they going to be able to make that determination? And if we're getting people swiping away and not even coming and showing your house and you're basing it all off of that, it's because buyers have no idea what's going on out in the public. Does that affect you? Absolutely. 
Is there anything I can control about that? Just if my phone rings, I can talk to them. I got to get my phone to ring, which means we can't push the market until they come in. Now, when a buyer comes in and they make an offer to you, are they going to try to negotiate? Yes. Can I use that as a negotiating tactic? Absolutely. But as a marketing tactic, it's going to be very difficult because there's no data out in the world that to change a buyer's. Buyers don't know that. And buyers know everything nowadays because the information's public. It's, it's, we're no longer the gatekeepers of information. They're very smart when they come to the table, but they may not have all the information. So back to comps. Um, what I'm looking here is just seeing if anything is matching with the address. Pismo Beach, Irish Way, we already picked it. I'm trying to stay away from Grover Beach because it seems like I have enough comparables to go off of. Balboa, Grover again, Grover again. I am keeping a track in my head what could potentially work if I run out of comps and I need two or three just to put on. Because again, it's a conversation piece. Yes, it's in Grover Beach, but this is what's going on out in the world. Totally different market, but let's say a buyer doesn't really care about the city. We need to be ready for that to know what our competition is. Maybe they're all about the view and they really don't care if it's a Pismo or Grover address. We need to, we need to know what we're competing with. Well, like that one's AG and the lot size is similar, but the square footage is so much more. I, I mean, would you even use that? Only if I have to. Right now, I feel like I have enough ammo to go to the table with that I don't need to take the conversation here. If you could use it and use, utilize the price per square foot if you had to on something like that, where it's almost double what the square footage is of the other one? Every single, I guess here's a good challenge to you guys. Every single one of these properties has some, some thing similar to the property you're selling. As a, as a strategy at home when no one's watching, I'd be going through each property, picking a subject property and going through every single property I see on the MLS and trying to come up with a scenario or a hypothetical why I feel these are similar and differences. Because the moment you can do that on the fly, the moment you're better at your job. Literally, I can pick this property right here and come up with a 276 North 5th in Grover Beach. Now, Grover Beach is gonna be a different territory than Pismo Beach, obviously. So there's gonna be a price change there. This is a three bedroom, two bath, very similar in square footage. And it is active on the market. So for a $100,000 difference, a buyer could do a lot with a hundred grand if this one has a view versus not a view. So let's go through and look at that view. So the view to someone that has a view, they're going to beat us regardless if our house is better with a better location. However, our condition of our property and we're a single same condition. So we're valuing, this has been on for 60 to six days, no matter how beautiful that view is, it's still active. We have that Pismo Beach address, so there is value there. And we do have a peekaboo view of this. So we could use this as a comparable, but of course we have to adjust our price because of the location. Every single one of these comps, I can go through and make up a scenario of why it fits for the, the way I need to make the comp. Do I want to do that? No, you want the ones that are most <coughs> like your property. But sometimes you run into, you don't have them and you have to make scenarios up. So I challenge you guys to go through, pick random properties and come up with scenarios and think like a buyer and see how you, you know, do it in the mirror, write it down, come back on class, tell me what your thought process was and see if like, I'll give you my opinion, throw it out there with amongst the agents. Like, Hey, I picked this property. That's what we can do on the hub. I'll throw a property up and say, analyze this property. And I want everybody to post a comment of give me, one negative and one positive and what, what your value you would be just based on one comp. And let's have some fun and see if like, cause all we're doing is coming up with scenarios, making the buyer feel that you, you've taken the time to analyze stuff. Um, all right, so where'd we stop? Here. Okay. Here's another Grover, no bueno. Another Grover. Grover, Pismo, Highlands, got to throw it in there. It's got that Pismo address. Again, I only have four comps right now. I need six to make me feel comfortable. 
So bottom line, it's got a Pismo address, three bedroom, two baths, 1,700 square feet, 6,000 square foot lot. Closed, 710, just in a different neighborhood. I don't even know where that neighborhood is. Oh yeah, it's down it's on, the left on the left of it. Okay, great. So now I got two can Terrace and I got this neighborhood and I got one in my neighborhood. I'm, I'm prepared. Just on that alone, I'm ready to go. Do you look the pictures on that one to see if the inside of the home is better? I haven't gotten there yet, okay. so but I will. Um, Joyce Way, definitely another great one. This is pending. Four bedroom, three bath, 1,900 square feet. It's been pending seven days. I got to take it. And Grover Beach, no. No. Just because I have my six doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I'm going to get through all 38. I want to know. Here's one I've already picked. Here's another one, three bedroom, two bath, 2000, very big home, Joyce Way, same size lot, gotta take it. That's probably a big comp that you used, huh? Yeah. Uh, a, yeah. Uh, I didn't see radius as much as single level. Okay. I took my gamble on that. That's okay. So three bedroom, two bath, 2000 square foot, pending 752. <clears throat> Got to take it. Now we're getting up there. This I got to be careful on because I've already kind of built a price range in my head. I know 690 to 710. So what is the max of my 3%? So that's going to put me at like 6, 14, 21. So at 710, that's going to be 735. It's going to be my absolute max. I start showing comps at 775 that I know are completely different neighborhoods. I don't want to fill my CMA with a bunch of these comps. I want one just to say, Hey, there is this valuation that's pushing you, but even that it's been on the market for 131 days. So if that way I'm prepared that if my client pushes me to a 750 or 760 price, I got ammo to use this to basically bring her down. Because if, because again, think of that trend in the market. Oh, it's not there. Think of that trend. This is my market. This is my range. She's trying to price it off of a whole different trend. Yeah. So if she comes to me and gives me anywhere near that price, it's like, let me show you what a buyer could buy for that price. And they've been on for 131 days. There's no statistical data. If you were a buyer, Mr. Seller, if you were out shopping right now, and let's be honest with ourselves because we're not trying to lie to ourselves. I want to get the most for your money, but we're trying to sell, not list. If you were a buyer and you saw this active on the market, would you go look at it? That's all I have to ask. Would you look at it? Because yeah, I'd, I'd look at it. Well, so will every other buyer too. And this neighborhood is better than your neighborhood. It's a higher price value properties based on comparables and what things are selling for in that neighborhood. They tend to go at a higher price than yours. The amenities, and this is where you can bring amenities in. The amenities in your house, this is an upgraded version. You're good, they're great. There's a difference there. It's a different type of property. It's not apples for apples. This is a, even though it's built in 1990s, do you think this has the same feel as a 1990s home when you go through? It's a little bit bigger. Yeah. Yeah, there is something to say about that. It is three bedroom, two bath. It does have carpet, it does have paint. It does look like it has a little bit more style when it comes to floor plan. It's a little more custom. So even the word custom means value. It's like. Are you ever showing this on your computer at your client's home? So when I, this on your computer? okay, we got 15. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go 20 more minutes and then we're gonna wrap. Okay. Um, Yes, I'll bring my computer if I feel like I'm losing it, but I shouldn't have to revert back to my computer. That takes way too long. Right. Yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this data. So once I get my six, seven comps, I have it printed on my cloud CMA and I'm ready to rock and roll. But right now I got to get my, my comps. I got to know what properties I'm going to use. Um, I got to find a property that is active, not sold, active, in a different trend of a market. That way, if they push me to that price, I got ammo to push back down. That's what I'm, so this, I could use it, but I do wanna see if there's a better one. 
Oh, shoot. How do I go back? Just go back. How do I go back? Just go back and I'll take you. <laughs> I've done that, so I know. Which, yeah, speaking of which, do you like create a cart right off the bat to save it? So just because all I'm doing right now is just getting my comps. Okay. So here's again, these are all software like technical this and that. Goal is just get your mindset in perspective of a buyer. How do you create a um, all that sort of stuff? Creating carts, it's great to go back in time. But once I pick my comps, I literally build my CMA in ten minutes. Once I have my comps. Um, this one is closed. I'm still wanting an active because active means competition. Closed is market set. Mm -hmm. Active is competition. And the longer it's on as an active, the longer the days on market are, which means I could easily rip that house apart and be like, they're trying to get that price. They can't even get it. It's a custom house. It's a different neighborhood. It's a nicer valued property. And you're trying to get that price too. What do you think a buyer is going to want? The nicer of the properties that they can negotiate and still get a price down? Mm -hmm. Or because you want to, you know, because, because what are your needs of selling? And they're like, this is what I need to sell or whatever. Um, okay, we got four more to go through. Robin Circle, AG, Grover Beach. At this point, four bedroom, too big, 2,400. This is really not even apples for apples. If I brought that to the table, I'm, on the, I'm stretching. Like, um, you know, I, it's, it's hard. So I wouldn't pick that one just because it's a bigger house, bigger square footage, larger lot. There's a lot of differences just on the functionality of the house. It's too hard to like explain every single, if I had brought this one, I would have to make adjustments for each one of these things. I'd have to make adjustments for bedrooms, lot size, square footage, and then price and location. So I'd have like six, seven adjustments that I'd have to make versus if I pick something else and I only had to adjust one for location. In my head, that's what I'm thinking is. Okay, so now that I've picked all my comps, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It says nine on the comps. Eight, nine. Oh, sweet. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Did you get the limerick one? You know what? I'm not even gonna go back and look. I got nine comps. I got enough ammo to come to the table. At the end of the day, once I compile all this data, if it's not there, do I still have my scenario? Am I happy with my scenario? Yeah. And I got to hit it from every angle. I got to be ready for if they push me up here, I got to be ready for what my competition is on actives. Now, again, I bring this whole entire sheet, but I have a whole strong scenario when I come to the table. Um, I did not get down to the nitty gritty of the detail of a two story versus one story. It didn't because it, that's too, that's, that's almost like an appraisal type. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to give appraisals. We're trying to sell homes and market homes. So this is a marketing strategy, not an appraisal. This is a, what is a buyer's perspective and how can I get buyers to come into your home? So see, when I was doing it, I was trying to think, okay, from buy, different buyers' perspectives. So some buyers just want that FISMO yeah. zip code. Some are looking for a view or neighborhood area and location within, even if it's like Robin Circle. I mean, maybe it's AG versus Pismo, but it's still that side, that bigger neighborhood. Um, and then the single level I thought would be a bigger sway, but we're, How seeing, many? we're getting the, the showings, but we're not getting an offer yet. So. And when I and get done here, I can almost guarantee you're within my 3%. I would have taken that price too all day long. The yeah. price that you start. You're 100% like, in the valuation. So yeah. your valuation got you to the same point. It's just, do you have That's enough ammo now yeah. to be able to help adjust it back down? Or are we now, like, did we set ourselves up that we were so confident about this price and now we're not? Right. And now it's like, oh, I got to come back to the table with the seller and come up with a new strategy. And that is what gives me a captain without shake fish. I mean, I said, okay. we're going to shoot for this. We're going to gamble on the. Yeah. You know, the older retiring demographic looking for single level wants to be in that vicinity. Yeah. But be prepared for You never want to leave yourself with one strategy. Because if that strategy doesn't work, your seller is going to blame your strategy. Okay. And it's so I have multiple <coughs> strategies on how I came to this price. So if that if that valuation, it goes, okay, well, you know, we, we push for the strategy, but 
what I'm, what I'm finding is because of this, this, and this, and we had talked about it. So what I'm finding is there's different neighborhoods with actives and these people are doing trends of bringing the price down, which is definitely affecting you. Because as a buyer's perspective, they're seeing these trends going down and looking at these properties too. And it only takes one and all of a sudden one of our main comps has been wrapped up. That was our one buyer, which means we came in second position to someone else. That, that buyer had some reason why. And if it's kind of apples to apples and it's a little bit to the view, it's, that's great, you have a view, we need to use that. But how do we beat our competition so we're in first position for that one buyer? And that's, you know, that's a big, so now that we have all of our comps, I use this cloud CMA. I click on that. Everybody needs to have your cloud CMA set up. Um, for me, I like it just because it comes out as like a pretty report. The matrix seems very data driven. This seems very like Zillow and pictures and color and pretty. And it, it has all the same data. I'll put my client's name in here. Um, shoot, it's not letting me put anything in here. Now we discount, it's okay. All right, so we gotta go for it. <laughs> um, this is the big thing with Cloud CMA. I put the MLS numbers, the moment I clicked on that, it brought the, the MLS numbers over. I didn't use this automatically choose by my comps for me. That's me doing the research. This is the system doing it for you. Um, the system doing it for you, you've missed out on, you basically said, you figure out my strategy. I'll just figure, I'll just go along with whatever you come up with. And it's, it takes you out of the equation. And that's what they're hiring is you. They want your knowledge. Quick question. Did yeah. you, uh, I just missed a step. Did you cut and paste each of the? No, the moment I was in the MLS. So the moment I'm here, yeah. I came down to Cloud CMA. The moment I clicked right here, it brought all that data over. Uh, I've never done that. I've, I've never, never done, done that either. Paste every single and one it in. brings it all over. Um, but that's because you put the listing number in the box. That's because I checked. No, well, I checked right here. Them. So and all these are my comps. Right. It only brought the ones that I checked over. Right. So I did my radius. I checked my comps. And then I come over to Cloud CMA and I clicked. And it brought all those comps over automatically and I didn't accidentally input anything. Um, and then I'm going to go fetch data. This, now that I fetch my data, this is where I make my adjustments. Now I'm on to the next step. Dang, I can't leave blank. No, plug it in. I have a quick question while you're waiting for that. Okay. Like for this property specifically, it, it basically it's a neighbor, is a hotel. Like Just plug it. Yeah, if you can plug them just all into the... Just plug every single one into the USB and. Do you factor that in as a, a negative or a potential, or do you not? I'm even sorry, like, I didn't hear the question. So, the question? like this specific property, like it sits, it's a, it's We're good. a lot, and it's big, but the one across from it is actually it's it's a hotel. Okay. So again, do you factor that in, or do you just not even? You assume that the new buyer is going to fall in love with the house, and you don't factor that in, and you can have that conversation with the client. If I have comps, it was factored in based on those sales, if my comps were within that radius too. So I don't have to go down the direction. Now again, if my client pushes me to this value and it's a negative because it's blocking view, I'm gonna make sure I use that when I try to bring their value down. But all these other houses are dealing with the same thing you're having to deal with. You know, and they already sold or they didn't sell or, you know. Now again, this is cookie cutter type home. If this is a unique and you have no comps, then you have to kind of, you have to make your scenario up to fit what you're trying to do. Um, all right, so once I'm here, put the client information in, fill in your property. So three, two, okay. oh, three. Square feet. Oh, there you, go. there you go. So if you want, it'll auto populate it if it's been on the MLS before. <laughs> All right, and then just fetch data. Um, now, depending on how my comps came out in this case, it's gonna come out and give me a pretty close to my range. So you can see the lows are set 620. 
Mediums are 710, average is 698, highs are 752. I don't really have to make too much of adjustments. I don't have to put it on paper. I can just leave it raw and talk to them about it. Or I can actually go in and come in here and make adjustments. Like for this one, I can make adjustments because uh, different neighborhood, you know, ultimately the story that I put with these individual comps, I can come in and make an adjustment for that. I don't really like to make adjustments because then we get into a conversation of why did you make an adjustment, right, blah, blah, blah. For this much money for this, yeah. for a third party. I'm not doing an appraisal. I just want to show them the raw data. This is what's going on in the market. Why do I want to adjust? I just want to show you what's going on in the market. Based on what's going on here, you have Irma Way, three bedroom, two bath. It's a little bit smaller, but it closed at 620. So is your, if they're pushing me to 750, is your location better than $100,000 for that location? Down here, here's closed, 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 pending. Do you sort those in any sort of way, just as a question, or do you just leave I just go through my head. How am I gonna talk to them about it? Now, these two are obviously, and what I try to do is find one to two comps that are just dead on. And I'm just gonna, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm a narrowing down on those one, two comps. Everything else is my supporting documentation, my backup. So on this, we're at 289 Irish Way. We have one listed for 739. It has not sold. It's a little bit bigger house. It hasn't sold, which means it's direct competition. It's no longer like a comp. It is direct competition to you trying to sell your house, Mr. Seller. So at the end of the day, we have to get in front of that price. So that right there put a cap on me at 740. I have a very strong argument to be like, if I was a buyer and we have very two similar properties and you're trying to go 750 and this is a little bit bigger with a little bit bigger lot, that buyer is gonna beat it out, which means you're in second position, which means we gotta wait for the buyer to, to wrap this property up then you'll be in line. And at that time, another property can come on the market and you're just pushing yourself longer and longer. And you're telling me you want to sell in 60 days or 90 days. The average is 60. We have to get in front of that price right there. That just put a ceiling on it. He can't even argue that. It's like the logic makes sense. Yeah. So I've now, cool. I know that he's not going to push me higher than that. Then I come down here to this Irish way and I go, well, here's a three bedroom, two bath. 1589, it sold for 675. That was the last sale in your area. The average is about 710. So if the average is 710, we had one sell at 675. You know, my range to you is going to be anywhere between 7 and 715, is what I think. If you got an offer, I think we would seriously consider looking at the offer and negotiating the offer. I never once told them what the price price was. I just said, if you got offers between 700 and 715, I would advise you as, as your agent to seriously consider negotiating that offer. What does a negotiation mean? It doesn't mean I want to push it higher in price. It could be terms. It could be a million things, but we are going to entertain offers in that range because we can't start the process until we get offers. And in that range, you should get offers all day long. What was the price that you wanted to sell? And he'll be like, well, I wanted to sell at 750, 730. All right. Well, at 730, we're going to be in direct competition with that property. He has now guided me that all I have to do is talk about that one property. I don't have to talk about much anything else than that one property. So he pointed me and I just followed his lead. So keep before in mind. you go, what's your number? Do you choose a number? In your own so before I go, I set up here and I go, all right, I'm looking at 705 to 715. And what did you, how did you determine that? I, I know. Okay, how did I determine it? It was one, it was within my 3%. I definitely know that I have to beat this property. There's no question there. So I can't go higher than 740. I did see that there was a 675 here. And just based on my comps right now, this right here gave me my median price of 710. So just each of those nine properties as a combined unit, 710 is the average. So I'm looking at average. Now, this is what I told them to really consider properties. What did I say about my 3% price? I said I would go 
which means that would put me at 739 and I'd still take the listing. This is what I told him that these are where I feel offers are going to come in at. So he goes, well, but I also explained to him that every buyer is going to want to try to negotiate with you. Now, if we hit it right out of the gate and someone comes in at 715 right out of the gate, then we obviously are within the range and we did well. If we get multiple offers, we might push it to 715, 7 or 720, 725. But this is the average. What are you trying to, I'm trying to sell in the next 60 days and I want the most money possible. What was your price? Well, my price was 740. All right, that's within my 3% range. I'd feel comfortable because knowing that you're within my 3% range, I feel that you should at least enter, get offers at that price. He says, I want to be at 779. We're way overpriced. Now you got your work cut out for you. Now you got to start explaining this sort of stuff. That makes sense. What if yeah. you didn't choose the Joyce Lee ones and then your median was 675? Then what do you do? Well, mm -hmm. I had to choose it. It made sense when I looked at three bedroom, three bath, 2000 square foot. And it's, again, if I, if I, if I had to adjust, then I'd make my radius smaller. There was 38 properties to go through. We individually went through every single one of those 38s, but I didn't nip, I didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't, no. I didn't think like two story versus one story. I just thought, well, what is my competition and what has sold? No, and you don't even, that's it. Nothing yet okay. because that now is a conversation because this is strategy. This is not appraisal of the house. This is a perspective of what a buyer is going to come in at. He goes, well, I wanted 730, 745 because of my upgrades. It's still within my 3%, so I'm comfortable with that. And I go, well, I feel like you're going to get, you know, the average is here, but the average also is a 1990s, not upgraded. And I see you do have upgrades. So I could feel definitely that we're not pushing the market. Now, if his upgrades are $100,000 and it literally is comping his house to like a 2019, then that's a huge difference adjustment. You know, that is a big deal. That's like, all right, here's what the market is allowing. You know, it's allowing this price on all the average of the homes. You've dumped $80,000 into your house and there's value in a buyer would perceive that because of the condition of the property. So, but I knew that going into it. And so I would have to still take these comps, but then I need a couple comps that actually reflect a 2018 type home maybe in a completely different neighborhood, but at least I have one to two to say, the condition of this home more is in line with your condition. This is what your neighborhood is allowing. You need to create a market that's not there. We can't get dollar for dollar for your remodel. There is some depreciation, there is some, you chose it, but it does bring value. And this is where you just have to kind of have an idea of like, well, he spent 80 grand, so a $50,000 value wouldn't be abs absurd. You know, or did he do the work himself? Well, how much did he spend on materials? I did all this. I, I did the sweat equity. You know, I, I, I do my own con construction. I did it right. I have my permits. Everything's good. Well, what did you spend on materials? All right, well, definitely <laughs> we should be able to get cost of materials back all day long and then add a little. So $80,000 remodel, and he got it for $30,000. $50,000 is still reasonable, maybe even $60,000. But you're explaining to him on a marketing strategy, not an appraisal, on a marketing strategy, buyers are going to ask why. And if her value is at 710 range is what, what things are going for, and we add another 60,000 on, we're now at 775. These are the two comparables for a whole different market. Are you, are you, in, in, are you in agreeing that we are going to create a market and that's going to take time? You're hiring me to build a market that's not there statistically, and we're going to set a new trend. So if you're understanding that, I'm going to have to have time to do it because I need to read the trends. I need to set the price. It, it logically makes sense. So, I mean, I could sell it if it really made sense. Like the house used to be worth 710. No one else in the neighborhood has upgraded their house. Why not? It's a whole different product but this is like every other product. So 
Um, that make, makes sense a little bit? Okay. Um, and then you come down here, customize report. Again, I'm, I'm looking at trends, not specifics of countertops and this and that. That's my strategy and I don't, it doesn't work all the time because sometimes sellers want that, but I have to maneuver at the table. I didn't build my whole trend CMA around that. That's what an appraisal, an appraiser is for that. I'm a marketing person. I'm going to tell you what buyers are thinking and what our direct competition is and how we have to get in first position or else we're going to have to wait for that to go away. And they're like, well, I'm not really ready to list. Great. Then everything I'm talking about right now is, is, is pointless because we might be listing in February. So when I take the listing contract, it's like, well, why don't we put our range value on of what we talked about today and we'll come back to the price when we're actually active, ready to go on the market. We'll have that conversation. The question is, are you happy with my marketing strategy? And then it's like, it, it really has nothing to do with price at that point. Because they always go, well, I still got to do repairs. What would you do to clean the house? Wonderful. Well, we can redo this. We can have this conversation as we get closer to see if any of this data has changed. Maybe in your favor, hopefully not in, in against it. But that's that open dialogue with the client. And then on the listing contract, I'll put... I'll put a price and then I'll also put, or a range value. Uh, price may change as we go active on the MLS. Okay, so you didn't put a price. Yeah, but then why? You it's not, it's not going on the MLS, so it doesn't really matter. I just need a price to talk about. So We're not putting it on, so they feel comfortable. I may put a range value price, I may put a specific price, but I put a caveat that price to be determined before going on the MLS. And then I use that SELM that says I'm excluding it from the MLS. Yeah. And I, I can't do any marketing anyway, so price is irrelevant. I can't go out and talk about the property. I can hint about the property, but I can't specifically give details about the property anyway, because I've excluded my marketing. All I've done is taken a listing. Yeah. And then when, when they're ready in February, it's gonna be a lot, you're gonna have to go through this data again anyway. So it's like you're, you, you've built up more and more. Now you have an idea of what the seller wants. And now you can go, well, can I actually perform that? Or I got to come back to the table and have another conversation with them before we actually go active. But it's a lot easier of a conversation because you've gotten so much farther along and the, you know, you've built the trust. And that's what that whole thing was. So um, publish report. This is why I like Cloud CMA. All right, we're wrapping up in five. So it's publishing, play around with this, um, click on PDF and it comes out to 37 pages. It picks my subject property, talks about this, talks about what a cloud CMA is. You can go through and pull any of these pages out. There's no page numbers. So you literally can be like, I only wanna print page five, six and seven, skip nine, seven, 10, 11, 12, print this. And I mean, there's so much fluff in here. Take the change of color scheme. You throw, you know, your picture in here. Cool. Blah, blah, blah. You do want to make sure you have your license number and all your data, your contact information. In. I really you like do this. That when you set it up, right? yeah. yeah. I really like this because this is, I'm sitting that on the table when I'm talking about my scenario, because I'm pointing to, well, in this neighborhood, this is what this is doing. In this neighborhood, this is what this is doing. Then you have a nice neighborhood, then you have this. I can even write on here like one, two, three, four, five. As quality of construction goes, these are higher priced valued neighborhoods and trends this way. These ones are the ones that are active, direct competition. If I was a buyer, I'm gonna go look at all of these. If I'm a seller, you know, it, it, Sorry, if I'm a buyer, that's what I'm looking for is I'm looking for my actives because those are direct competition. And now I've built a map to physically show them and be like, if we went shopping, would you want to see every single one of these on this, on this block? And they're like, yeah, we want to see all the inventory too. Great. Those are direct competition. And then I build this scenario around, well, this one down the street is absolutely direct. They've already tested the market. It's already been on for 130 days. They still haven't sold and they're very similar in condition of property. We need to adjust. Um, so back to just looking at yours. Mm -hmm. You're the only active right now, I would hold. You don't have any direct competition driving your price down right now. 
you're just in a slow market. You're within the range of the 3%. I would still hold for a little bit longer to get past these holiday marks and find out that if February, when the market tends to get active, or when another property comes on that's an absolute direct competition to you, then you're gonna make a maneuver. But right now, there's nothing wrong with your price to, it's just, you don't have anything driving the market down other than the market itself. And that's just the 10 to the year, is my advice. Um, you are within, but if you got an offer between 700 and 715, okay. I'd strongly start negotiating, right? I mean, it, you wouldn't tell your client, this is garbage, throw this away. You'd be like, let's counter. <laughs> Let's get the ball rolling and see what we can do here. Um, so if you got an offer in the, in the high 600s, I'd probably tell them to pound sand, like until there's something adjusting that price. Um, yeah, but I would be keeping an eye on these joices. I'd be keeping an eye on like this one right here, this pending. The moment that actually, sorry, this pending. Okay, yeah. At 725, the moment that actually closes, if that closes at 725, that's going to be a direct, like, all right, adjustment, because you have another one that just closed that brought it back down. You can get in front of it, you know, because you do have these. See what I mean? Here's a trend 620, 675, 650. So these are all together. And then you have this as a trend. So it's like, what really is the difference compared to these? Is it the neighborhood? Because most of these are all three bedroom, two bath, same square footage. Is it the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Which means location. That's a big difference in price. Mm -hmm. And then you have this and this. These are selling, these are all joists. These are selling in the same trend. But this is a nicer neighborhood than here. Or just a different feel of a neighborhood. Just a different quality construction. Like, you look at that's where you're looking at the amenities that's where you're looking at the view that's where you're looking at the actual property but even this you're within your three percent you're still within the range to get offers but if this one closes and this thing closes at like 700 now you're outside your three percent it's like now you have a close that really pushed the market back down same thing right here pending on joyce if this thing closes in the low 700 range now you definitely have a direct like adjustment because this is starting to push the top and if not even over that 3% range of, of it. Uh, and then right here, you know, that one hurts. That hurts. Right. And so it's, a ra the reality is you'll probably end up settling somewhere in the 710, 715 or a buyer's going to ride an offer and the longer you stay on the market, the lower the buyer writes at first. So it's those type of conversations, Mr. Seller, are you wanting to move it now or do we want to keep continuing to push? Nothing has affected us just yet, but it's in the works. You know, this and this, it, it's coming. Right. And I can't tell you what's going to happen, but the moment these things close, that's going to be a direct effect to your property value. Mm -hmm. It's like, so do we want to get in front of it before those things close? We have less than 30 days. And, and then you can go back and find out when did they go, when did they go uh, pending? And you can assume 30 to 45 day escrow. So it's like, call the agent. <laughs> and there you go. Call the agent and be like, Hey, Hey, can you, you know, let me know. Um, but that's, I mean, that is going to be an effect in the next 30 to 40 days. I don't know when they're pending, but you can go through and look at this. This breaks down. So I'll take this. And then this last page, I will take this with me. Because if they're like, well, I never want my client to think I picked the ones that I wanted to guide you. So let me show you, this is everything. I just chose the ones that I felt were the most comparable based on square footage, lot size, just the, the basic average blank. But here's everything that's going on. But when I print this, I print it with the price going down. Because again, I'm looking down, for 620 at the top, 700 at the bottom. Because I'm looking for large breaks in the trends. So 600s to 620s, uh, that's kind of a small little break right here. And then coming down, these are all, I mean, this is a very standard type home. There's a lot of turnover. You, you'll see it when you do stuff like this and it's like 600 and then boom, you start at like 669. Huge gap, which means this market 
is the top, this is the bottom of the next market. And, and then when they start pushing you, it's like you're jumping to a whole different market. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you really were going to a client with that, would you feel okay with just one active? Like, would you dig a little deeper if you weren't in a class that was ending in a few minutes? Um, just to balance it out and say I've got two or three. Hours. I would do, yeah, I would do two, but they would have to be Grover. They'd have to be Grover. So then I've created a whole nother conversation piece that talks about this is your okay. only direct competition. And I would actually use this to their benefit on why they need to list right now. Because this is what's, this is what's dictating what the market price is. This is where buyer's choices are. I'm sorry. This is dictating market price. This is what buyer's choices are. Buyers don't have much choices. If you have three, four, five here, then we actually have to be aggressive with our marketing. We could piggyback off at this price. That's why I'm not scared to get close to this price at all. And that's, yeah, that's exactly why I was willing to agree to a higher price. It was like, you're in a good position. There's not They are in a great position. The There's nothing else. I mean, even my, like my client the other day wanted to go look at your property. Why? There's nothing else There's to look nothing at. nothing out there. And he's looking for a replacement. So he's right. Gonna, when when she likes it, they're going to come back to here. Right. But what else is a buyer going to look at right now? So we can start anywhere we want. Is that still going to drive traffic? If I have five of these, <laughs> then we better stand out or be aggressive in our pricing or just stand out to make sure we get the buyers to even come and, and show up. Okay. Um, and it still isn't within my, based on this, it's still within my 3% range. So I'm okay. I'm, I'm comfortable. It's going to still drive buyers to come look. But if they try to price you at $7.99, right. buyers won't take the effort to even leave their house <laughs> to go look at your price. That's where, I don't know where I came up my 3%, but it tends to just work. I like test, it. test it yourself. Awesome. But I explain it to my client, and I, I think I even said that. I try not to take listings over 3% of what my price is. And when I sell, I'm usually within 1%. And they go, okay. And you're pushing me more than 3%? Because she said, how do you feel about it? You're over my 3%. I feel uncomfortable. I think we're wasting, but you're not ready till February. How about we table this conversation and we'll come back to the price in February? What do you think of my marketing and my strategies? Do you tell him that you feel uncomfortable or do you say- What did I say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he said yeah. he felt uncomfortable. Yeah. You don't say like, I would feel, I don't feel confident it, in that price point that you're gonna get the results you want. That's I. I, 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 it's no, I, I'm all about my marketing and I feel uncomfortable with putting my marketing out there that I'm not going to get the return on the phone calls. And I can't, if I don't get phone calls, I don't have a product to sell. So it's not that I'm concerned that I can't sell your house at the price. I'm concerned that a buyer isn't going to take the time to even call me. Once I get my phone to ring, I can sell the heck out of your house. I need my phone to ring to be able to get the product. That's a whole different approach. You're hiring me to do sales. I get that, but I'm also not this, I'm going to give you an expectation, just tell you what you want to hear. It's like she literally, I'm coming to the table at like, you know, 400 range and she's pushing me for four thirties. I'm going, and there is nothing there. <laughs> you know what the property I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. And I'm like, that's good luck. <laughs> like I, you know, that's crazy. I was like, well, it's, those are words in my head. <laughs> That's not what, That's I'm, what I'm saying. saying. Like, how do you, like, what um, I did say I was uncomfortable. I said, based on my analysis and doing with my experience, I try to stay within my 3% of my value just to make my phone ring. If I'm a sell, if I'm a buyer and I always go back to buyers, if I'm a buyer laying in bed, looking at Zillow and switching or going through my website and looking at properties and I come across, I've obviously been shopping for a while. This isn't something new. So I see something and they're like, honey, look at this one. Ah, they're, they're, they're dreaming and they just move right along. I don't want that impression to, to land in the buyer's head. And at your 430 price, there's no statistical data that supports it. So if we did that, you're creating a market, which means I need a, a long, you, ha, you are almost like a make me move type buyer. You have no motivation to move. You just want to see what the market's going to allow. And if that's the case, I need to know that because it is going to dictate on how much cost I come up with on our marketing. I'm not going to hit it hard in the beginning if we're trying to outprice the market and you want me to dump $3,000 right now and we have no motivation until next year to move. So maybe, maybe even a better strategy is why don't we take this listing right now 
and we'll come back to this one, you know, through the holidays and then come on in February and we'll do it that way. But I still built my pipeline. You know, I still got the listing. I don't walk away without a listing. I don't care if it's two years long. It's a listing. So you, know, you got the listing. I got the listing, but we're not going to do anything until after the holidays. Still got the listing. Yeah. You know, but did I commit to that price? No. I put a range value that said, we're coming back to talk about this over because I'm not done with you yet. We're not done with this. It's like, we got to get realistic when we go on. So maybe her motivation is going to shift because maybe we find a property in February and all of a sudden she's like, I want to move. And it's like, okay, we got to get realistic here. So now again, I'm not saying like take a bunch of listings for six months from now because we got we to gotta have sales immediately. But you do have to listen to your client. I knew going into it that she wasn't ready. She straight up was like, I'm not ready. Now, maybe that's bad sales on me where I didn't help her understand why it's hot to do this right now. But I also know when to push and when not to push. And she was very transparent with me that I am not ready. My house is not ready. I do not want to do this right now. I'm not committing to anything. And that's, it, for me, it's like, all right, let's hear her why she's not ready and what's next for 30 days. I'll take it. You know, and then we'll get started at the first of the holidays, the first of January, we'll start our marketing campaign and we'll go on sometime at the end of January. And when okay. they feel pressed, like why do I need to sign anything today? What's your Did opinion? she feel pressed? Um, there was a little hesitation, not, not because she was doing the paperwork now, but just because of a prior experience that she had with another agent. And so just the way that David presented it, she was pretty comfortable. With she said, I mean, I was, I was surprised. I was in shock that, you know, she signed it. I was like, wow, good job, David. Yeah. I mean, if everyone's on board, you all know you're going to meet back in 30 days. Are you happy with the way I communicate with you? Are you happy with the way on how I present my, my strategies to you? Yes. So it sounds like, do you want to hire me? I know that's kind of a closed ended question. No, I don't. But 99% of the time, by the end of it, you can get a feel like, yeah, I would like to hire you. Or they say no. Okay, no problem. What is it that you're concerned of? Right. And they're like, well, I wanted to talk to another agent. They're telling me what my objections are. And it's like, da, 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 da. We'll tell you what, you know, I hear your objections and now I'm into objection handling. It's like, you know, you need another agent. Do you think another agent can do anything differently from what I explained to you? And do you think I have a complete handle on my strategy? Do you think I'm a master of my strategy? Yes. Wouldn't you want to hire someone that knows their strategy inside and out? Can my strategy work for you? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, are you uncomfortable with my price? Well, again, we put, we tabled the price. You know, this is your property. You're in control. I just want to give you a, a, a realistic, what you're up against. I'm not here to tell you what your house is going to sell for. I'm here to tell you what I think buyers are going to offer you. You're the one countering and making decisions on whether or not you're accepting the offer. And she goes, oh, okay. you know, and it's like, um, I only take, I, use, I do use this. I only take two to three clients a month because I don't want to overextend it's myself. It sound like you need to reserve a spot. I'm, I'm just, I am, you're hiring me just as much as we're going to work together for the next 120 days. Do you think I'm somebody you can work with? Yes. Well, I do reserve, you know, I only take two to three clients a month because I don't want to overextend myself and affect my service. And that is a true statement. Now, whether I have three clients I'm working with every single month, totally different. I'd love to have three clients every single month. Reality, maybe one to two clients I'm actually closing on every month. But if I started extending and I just took listings all day long, that's not the business I'm in. I want to get a listing, get them into contract and sell the property, not take a listing and sell it a year later. Most people don't want that. By the time they come to me, they, they're ready to move. They're ready to like, at least within six months, they're getting things rolling. Um, okay. okay. And then just to answer your question, Lucas, this is what it looks like. So I got pictures of all the insides of the house. And wow. I, I sometimes have cut out some of the, the stuff to bring this down to like a 10 page report, because I know that people are like, they want, oh, they want you in and out. They don't, they might even tell me. Like, and they always want to jump to the meat. Yep. They and, always want to jump to the meat of it. And it's like, Hey, before we get in there, let me show you my value. And I do stop the meat and go into the presentation. Yeah. It, but I do prep them. Look, I'm not going to waste your time with an hour long presentation, but let me just get the highlights of what I do for you. And I take usually 15 minutes, 20 minutes. What's your feeling on the RPR versus the, um, this report? I don't even know what the RPR is. Well, I, yeah, 
Uh, that's the the one that we get in Matrix. Mm -hmm. We have a little mini report. Nope. Yeah. I like this better uh, than the RPR. I, mean, <coughs> I told you, I'm I, once I find something that I works, really like I don't change it. This, I really like this one, but uh, again, it's like my because we used to be Rapid Pony and RPR is my go-to. Yeah, I like this better than the RPR because the RPR prints the range for you and. I, don't, I didn't like that personally because my analysis gave me something different. Than the reality is I can take these nine camera cards <laughs> and this one page and feel completely confident that I can go and sit down and talk with someone about that data. I don't need the bells and whistles. I need the raw data to show them. That's my point. And I'll say this going in this way, because I've done a cloud CMA report, but I go in, you know, when you first log in yeah, to, and, and I on. click on that right away, and then yeah. I put in my criteria, it's a lot different because then you That's don't, you have no control over yeah. what you just did. Well, I have to That's why I don't. Every yeah. Yeah. Generate, and then, 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 then you have to exclude it. it. Yeah. 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 Always use the MLS as your source okay. and then move it over. Because this is this you can because from right here I can click on tax returns, and again if I'm if I'm outside the realm maybe we'll get it okay if I'm outside the realm of like new normal, you know uh, I can click on tax returns <laughs> and find out well what does that seller owe on the property as well if I'm comping another house because what they owe on the property a good agent is going to dig in when they go to present offers and find out man this person's made. A lot of money, I can definitely push a little bit on this price when I make my offer because they're literally walking away with $800,000. When you go to the tax returns though, does it show you the print, the, the first? It'll, show, the show, you the, it'll show you the, it'll show you the mortgage and when they got the mortgage and you just have to do the math in your head. If they had a mortgage and their payment was here and they've been paying on it for 10 years, they probably dropped $40,000. Will it show you if they took a line of credit or yes. a second though? Is what I meant. Yes, it's if it's a recorded okay. deed, if it's a recorded, um, Yes. Okay. Then it would be on there as long as it's like after a while. They're not going to do it after like two weeks or something. Yeah. It's, um, but there is that when I'm talking with my buyer, I'm looking at what the seller owes on the property because I want to know, even though it's not relevant and I'm not bringing it to the agent because it's an easy one to objection handle. Hey, what my client bought my property for is, is irrelevant to what it's worth today. However, when we start digging in deep, and the negotiation starts getting tight, I'm going to know that no one's going to want to walk away from $800,000 over two grand. And I can dig in and be like, I'm going to hold strong on my price right now because that, that they're walking away with a good chunk of money or, you know, and it's been on the market for a while and yada, yada, yada. So, you know, what they owe on a property is reflected yeah. on how you do your offer as a buyer without telling the agent because the agent's just going to beat you up. Like, doesn't really matter. But in your head, when you're talking to your client, you need to divulge that information. It makes you seem like you've done more research also. So, okay. That's all I got. Um, any other questions before we wrap? This was great. Thank you. Was this valuable? No valuable? Does anybody have anything else they want to add on the CMA on what their strategy is? No. <laughs> Obviously, your strategy worked. You got a listing. Thank you for being an example for me. I would have taken the listing and I probably would have been the same exact price too. We all have our ways on how we come to the table. Um, no, this was really interesting. Uh, I just, the, the mindset of you just did radius and you just bank on that. If you can, if it's not can. an oddball property. You can. Know, if it's an oddball, time. maybe I'll find an oddball one and we'll try to figure that out. Yeah. Honestly, it's, it's not an exact science. It's a confidence of like, here's my opinion. And you always got to keep that in mind. You're not appraisers, you're marketers. And it's not necessarily the value. It's how does, how are you going to drive traffic to the property? And if there's no traffic, you can't sell anything. <laughs> so even if someone pushes me on my price and I really am uncomfortable, like I went, who did I go with? Lucas. Church wanted to sell us a, a thrift store. And I'm going up oh, against yeah. get Jim Kelsey, Mark Burns, and myself. And it's a it's a it's a thrift store, like, and it's a Saint Barbara Barbara sort Barbara. of yeah. yes, yeah. you know, and it's got cinder block walls, and you know, and, but it's a thrift store, and da da da. So there's no other thrift store around that even makes sense. So then it's like, all right, different strategy. How much does it collect in rent every month? All right, well then, what's a typical cap rate? So what, what does an investor look at if they took that building, rented it, how much of that? 
once I had that information, it could put a value on it. So the same strategy of going to it, it's like, here's a value. This is what I think a value is. Ballpark, if we got into offers, this would make sense as an investor to come to the table with. Nothing to do with comps, totally different strategy. And then sat down, I ended up coming in second place. Um, they said my pricing was about five grand difference to the other agent, but it wasn't determined on pricing. It was a fact that I didn't have my CCIM license and half the board liked my marketing strategy and the other half um, really wanted, they wanted an older agent with, they felt with the experience of selling a, a commercial building. Um, and there was a board member that is in that company. So I was like, I'm sure there was an influence there, but at the end of the day, it, it did, I appreciate And I think I turned them off when I asked the question. So can you let me know what did the other agents come up with their price? That was my closing question after I, everything's all done and said and done. And, uh, the president board member said, I don't think I can divulge that information. I, yeah, I've heard of people getting arrested for talking about that. And no, no, no. You know, but it was, I could see that it like caught him off guard and little things like that. I lost the trust because I was like, I, I want to know, you know, and they're like, what's well, none of your business? But I wanted to know, like, I wanted to know how I priced because Mark and Jim, excellent agents. And I was like, I was honored to go in a room for a commercial building when they really run the commercial industry in this community. And I was even in the running for that. Um, so it was kind of an honor to me. You should have waited until they told you you didn't have them and be like, well, tell me how close that was. They did. They said your pricing was actually really right there. Everybody's was in that range. It's just, you know, the company they went with, there was a board member and then ultimately he had a CCIM license. I said, I, I completely respect that and I understand and, you know, call me if, if, if it doesn't work and I'd love to help you again. You don't get them all. <laughs> Thank you everybody for showing up and I hope that was a value to everybody and let's go get an escrow.